All right, it still says we're in a practice session. I don't know if that's true. Didn't send over. Huh? It's not starting? What's going on? Do I have to start it? Do we have to freeze? No, yeah, I don't know. Okay, I'll, I'll hit the start button. Let's see what happens. Okay. Oh, let's get this started. Once you click start, attendees can join. Yeah. All right, here we go. All right, welcome to uh, this uh, Athletics Canada webinar on sustainable club management. And uh, just uh, here with some pretty illustrious people, I'll let, uh, let everyone get, uh, get joined and, and settled in. The participant numbers rise there on, on the bottom. Thanks for, uh, for joining us at uh, 4.02 uh, p.m. In, in BC, uh, 7 now 7.03 p.m. in the, in the uh, middle of the country and uh, eight out, out east. Um, so I, I'm here today with, uh, sorry, I should say my name, in case you don't know, it says right there. My name is John LaFranco. I'm the Coaching Education Manager for Athletics Canada. Um, Today we're going to talk about sustainable club management. So how we make your club um, a bigger, longer lasting, sustainable success. And we have with us uh, four people who have, have done so. Uh, we have Maureen Lacroix, or Maureen Lacroix, Maureen Saint-Croix, sorry, from Ocean Athletics in BC, Kurt Downs from Border City in Windsor, Ontario, Bill McMacken from St. John Track Club in New Brunswick, and Alfredo villars Papi from Selenos Select in Montreal. Just to give you a bit of an idea of uh, you know, who, who these folks are and, and their, their kind of histories, um, Maureen has been involved with track and field since the age of 15 through the Vancouver Olympic Club, and her coach was uh, John Freeman. She was an 800-meter cross-country specialist. She was a national team member uh, until she got injured. Um, and had uh, apparently successful Achilles surgery to be able to continue running as a master's athlete uh, until she was 53, um, at which time she had to retire due to uh, knee arthritis. Um, and on the club side, um, she's been coaching in high school for 35 years. The Ocean Athletics Club has been running for about 16 years. Uh, it's a club in, uh, in South Surrey, BC, so sort of near Vancouver. Um, that's right, eh? Near Vancouver. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, that's a club that right now has a membership of around 430 people with athletes from six to eight years old, all the way up through uh, high school, university and some masters athletes as well. 23 coaches on staff um, and just running programs all year round. Kurt Downs is the head of the Border City Athletics Club where he's coached a variety of different athletes at all levels from youth to university, some Olympians and Paralympians. Um, He's also created the Women's Can Summit. Uh, he's been awarded the Athletics Canada Dr. Doug Clement Award for Coach of the Year and the Canadian Running Magazine Community Builder of the Year Award. Um, so Kurt's, uh, Kurt's coached two Olympians and one Paralympian, many national team athletes, and led Brendan McGride to a Canadian record in the 800. The Border City Club has around, around 100 members. Is that about right, Kurt? Approximately? <clears throat> about 150 total. 150 now. Okay. So um, another, another big club down uh, in the Windsor area. Bill McMacken is a 30 year business owner uh, whose operations span four Canadian provinces. Uh, so he's got the practical skills in business development, accounting, finance, marketing, and human resources. Uh, Bill is an active runner and he coaches at the development level and has held numerous leadership roles in our sport, including being the uh, president and head coach of the St. John, St. John's Reds track and field club also the president of Athletics New Brunswick and the chair of the board of Athletics Canada. Alfredo joined uh, the Saint Laurent Select Club. Actually, sorry, Bill, how many people in your club right now? St. John Track Club. Oh, 175, 180 this year. Okay, cool. Um, so uh, Alfredo joined the Saint Laurent Select Club in 1991 as an athlete and started coaching in 1994. Um, and since then, the club has grown from a small regional club with about three coaches and 30 athletes to uh, a national level organization with more than 12 coaches and about 300, two to 300 athletes, depending on, on the year. 
Um, it's the biggest club on the island of Montreal and works closely with uh, two universities here, McGill and University of Montreal. Um, the club organizes provincial meets, uh, two, three provincial meets every year um, and are closely involved with uh, the big, big events that go on in Quebec. They provide timing and meet organization services to schools and smaller clubs. Uh, and coaching education and, and, uh, and training. Alfredo also has a PhD in physics. And uh, after a few years teaching and doing research at Nostade State of Montreal, we started working in finance, developing mathematical models and algorithms for high frequency trading. So as you can see, <laughs> we have a very uh, illustrious and expert and professional panel here um, with us this evening. And, um, so I'm going to, I'm going to just sort of start asking them questions, but I also just wanted to, uh, sorry, while, uh, while we're here, um, if you have questions, uh, for our panel, you can put them in the question box at the bottom. Uh, and you're also welcome to ask questions in French, uh, Bill and Alfredo can answer in French. I know that for sure. Right, Bill? <laughs> yeah, just, uh, Alfredo can answer in French and, and if, uh, for the others I can translate if, if need be. Um, we'll have some questions at the end. Uh, well, answer your questions at the end. We have some planned questions that we're going to go through and we are recording this and uh, we will be posting it to our new website. Uh, the coaching education, new coaching education section is coming soon. Uh, and all our webinars will be available there. And uh, for coaches, if you've entered uh, your NCCP number in the registration, you can also get a professional development point for participating in this uh, today. All right, everybody ready? Cool. So the first question is, um, we're, we're gonna kind of start with the premise that a, a successful club is a large, full service club that has all of the events in track and field has multiple coaches that can support these coaches by, by paying them, maybe not everybody full time, but paying them and paying for coaching education. Um, how, how do we get there? So what would each of you say is the first thing to do for a coach uh, or, you know, person who is involved in track and field, but I think very often it's the coach that is the driving force behind club creation uh, who wants to start a club. Um, or has a small club that they want to grow. So um, maybe Kurt, do you want to start? Because I, I know you have a, a lot of uh, thoughts and ideas on this. And what's the first thing? What can we give to the people? Um, <clears throat> I think anytime you're starting uh, a business, a club, um, anything that you sort of believe in, I think you have to come up with sort of a divining philosophy. Um, what's the mandate? What is the, what are the important things that you're trying to bring to the group of athletes or the group of people that you're going to be servicing? So for me, um, in starting our club, um, and I think it's similar in a lot of, uh, other, uh, areas, whether it's East coast or the West coast, or even centrally in Canada, um, you have to come up with some form of philosophy. What do you believe in? Um, what do you want to, um, express to the group of people that, that you're working with? So for me, it's, it's definitely a philosophy of maybe in the form of a mission statement, um, maybe even so far as setting up some type of uh, pillars um, that sort of encompass all the things that you believe in. And then that makes it a little bit easier for you to, um, to, to uh, break it down into smaller components and a little easier for you to express to, towards the members of your, of your club or your group. Awesome. That's great. Maureen, what about you? What do you think is the, the, the Same one thing, thing I would the first you. thing? developing a, a philosophy um, about what you're trying to do. Are you looking at community sport development? Or are you looking to be in charge of a bunch of elite athletes uh, that, that that's the only ones you're going to concentrate on? Or are you looking to provide some kind of service to the community in, in a sport that, that provides so many different abilities to all the other sports that are out there? Our, our philosophy right from the get-go was that we were going to develop athletes. If we could you know, convince them to develop a, a passion for a track and field within that, then that was a bonus. But generally it was, you know, good training for the kids and, you know, across the board and, and make them into good athletes. You know, whether they went into other sports afterwards, they at least got really, really solid um, basics to begin with. That's great. That's great. Alfredo, how, how is the Santa Select Club? How did, how did it 
grow? What was the, the priority or the driving philosophy? I, I think one of the mistakes that were done initially in the club was that it was run as a one-man show or could be a one-woman show in another club. I think that's very, something very important to understand. You cannot build a big functioning, long lasting club uh, with a center on one person. You need to have multiple people with clear tasks, capable, competent, professional that can do the job. Um, so, so one of the things that I'm happy and proud of in terms of our club is that I know that if tomorrow morning I stop coaching, I stop being involved, the club's going to keep going. So it's not centered around me. And uh, we see too many clubs that seem to be centered around one person. And when that person mm -hmm. disappears, well, the whole program falls apart. So I think it's very important mm -hmm. to understand the, like the need for other people, an independent board, for instance. Uh, like this is something that a lot of coaches and even myself, when I started, I was a little scared about that in the sense that I want to control everything. I feel like people don't understand what's happening on the field. Like, they, they, like there's this kind of a that dichotomy between what happening administrative part and the, the what happened on the on the field and the, on the technical side but but really those two tasks those two jobs are very important and they need to be done and, and you need to find good people for, for 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 that board and they need to be independent also it's very very important for the whole safe port part of things you need to have a board that can be independent of the coaching yeah for sure yeah that's great and i think you know in, in building my club that was one of the things that i've tried to do and in sort of still trying to do and it's a process like it's not going to happen overnight is is that like kind of extricate my myself as the central figure and and build those support systems around and it so if you're if you're starting out like it, you don't need to just sort of back away completely i think coaches should use their energy that they have to to move things forward but but keep that in mind and, and build that scaffolding around bill you've, you've been a part of, of of different boards and things like that um, so I don't know if you want to talk to that sort of importance or just talk about your club and what the philosophy is and the, what the, the big priority is for you. Well, I think the key thing that people have to make a decision about when they're going to try to grow a club beyond a training group is that they really do want to grow and they have to start to make the decision to invest as much time working on their club, making it stronger as they do working on training sessions and coaching athletes. And that's a very challenging decision. If anybody probably not a bunch of business geeks on this call, but if you read the book called The E-Myth, it's the difference between working in your business versus on your business. And most coaches come in every day with the intent to just coach and try to keep their group and, and then feel very constrained by how big it can be because of their limiting limited ability as one coach or two coaches. Mm -hmm. What you have to decide is to make the time to build a club that's a business that's sustainable. you know, And that isn't so much numbers as it is program strength, consistency of programming, coaches that assist with it, some leadership around finance, shared decision-making with a board or a leadership group of some stage. And, and that takes a fair bit of investment in time. But what you then create is what Alfredo references, which is a sustainable coach uh, club, which means, you know, if I walk out and get hit by a bus, you know, hopefully the club keeps going. And, uh, and because it has a structure that's beyond any one or two individuals. But that's what I see time again. I see that in the business world. People who every day are too busy behind the till to make their business grow beyond what they can do themselves. And that's really what coaches have to think about is how do I myself or how do I find other people that will help me build the club and build those structures and invest as much energy into that as we do into delivering training sessions on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, that. That's great. And, you know, you started talking about business there, Bill. So it leads nicely a bit into my next question. And you're all from different provinces. And so there's probably different uh, avenues of, of funding and that sort of thing. But I think that the, the question on, on most coaches' minds is, is how, how, do we, how do we fund this? How do we bring in money? Because a big club can bring in money, but also is going to have, have costs. Like how do you afford to have multiple coaches and that kind of thing? So um, I don't know, we could, we can go west to west to east, maybe Marine, what, what sources of funding have you been able to access um, out in, in BC? Or maybe there's national things, but I just sort of assume that there's a lot of local stuff. Well, there's, we have, we have the, the, the BC lottery, the gaming, community gaming funds that we apply for every year. And they're not, I mean, they're not huge, about 18, $18,000 a year. So it, you know, it, it's a substantial amount of money. And we decided right from right from the get go in, in the first I don't know four or five years that none of our coaches were paid nothing everything went into the club for equipment and and uh, trying to build that base so that we had everything we needed to train athletes and and we 
we're fortunate enough to have coaches who bought right into that. And, you know, they, they weren't paid anything. They just showed up, they did their job, but the equipment they needed was all there. And so very quickly we, you know, we had, we had everything we needed um, to run a really, really strong program. And then the other thing we did is we invested in, in timing. We invested in the timing system. So that became, um, that became a source of income for us there's only a couple of good timers out there and um so we were that we were the go-to for lots of lots of clubs to host so we would we would have income from there but we could also host our own meets anytime any any size from in club to to as big as as we could go provincial championships and and we did we've done national uh cross country and and uh, masters as as well but we became, we decided right from the go to get very self-sufficient with all the tools we needed. And then we could expand from there. And, and with that, of course, then we were able to track coaches because they said, oh, okay, good. You've, you've got more than one hurdle. That, that's <laughs> awesome. And, and we had everything we, we needed to, to run an event. So if we needed 80 competition hurdles, we had them. We could run a full event. So that was our, that was our priority for the first year. And then we just keep going after grants and, 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 and sort of anything that that we can to, you know, because membership won't won't cover right what you, what you want to do. Yeah. So Kurt, I know um, we've spoken about about your your ability to to hire multiple multiple people over the summer and stuff like that. Can you talk a bit about that that program that you've tapped into and maybe some other other things that you've you've sourced for funding? Yeah. Um, so a few years ago, similar to what Maureen uh, was mentioning. As you sort of expand, you're looking to obviously get enough coaches to look after the athletes and and um, and cover them. So one of the things I found um, was that in the summers we had a huge influx of of athletes, um, maybe more so than than we could handle, which meant I had to hire more coaches. Um, and I started to look into grant opportunities and and things that were um, across sort of the province, a little bit in the country. And I found the Canada Summer Jobs Program. And one of the things that we um, have done in the last little while is we've used that to sort of supplement um, our ability to hire coaches in the summer for those that influx of of programming. Um, You know, we we ran a um, a spring program that we call spring foundations. And uh, the one year we had like 50 kids come to it just out of the blue. Um, And again, this summer, our summer program increased, you know, sort of exponentially because uh, I think COVID, you know, a lot of kids were looking for uh, something to do during the summers and we were offering programming and a lot of their sports weren't. So same sort of thing. We were able to hire 10 summer uh, um, intern positions, and we've used the money to be able to create um, sort of a vast array of jobs for them. We have some people looking for grant opportunities, uh, further grant opportunities. We have some of the summer students looking for um, uh, other income sources, so scouring the city looking for um, sponsors and sponsorship. Uh, we have some doing graphics and uh, um, media for us, uh, some doing coaching education, making sure that all the other staff has um, all the coaching education they need to have. Um, so basically, we, we set it up where um, each of them had a specific role in addition to being at the track because the number of hours they work at the track weren't enough to sustain the actual uh, summer job positions. So we, tr- we had to find other things for them to do. And, and that's basically what we ended up doing. So it's, it's worked very well. Yeah, that's great. I mean, you know, you, you suggested that program to me and we, we hired one, one coach, uh, sort of like kind of a summer sprint program because we mostly just a distance club. And then now because of that, the momentum from that, we're able to hire that guy back on for the rest of the year. And, and so it's, it's, it's like, and you know, the way you're talking about hiring someone to look for grants, you use that money to make more money. Right. Absolutely. So, yeah. So yeah. Alfredo, are you, do you have an algorithm that you've written uh, that uh, helps your club with money or what, what does San Luis select do? I know you mentioned timing and events before. Yeah, no, I'm not, uh, <laughs> I don't have that yet. <laughs> I'll let you know when I want I do. Um, so yeah, for, okay. for us, it's a little bit of the same. Uh, so, so we do apply for grants. Uh, there are different programs that allow us to hire people uh, from time to time in the summer. We, we have, there's very big grants at the provincial and like city level that we applied for, but I think there, there's the main, main the, um, 
a source of income and also just facility access and, and equipment and everything. It's really our partnership with the city of Montreal. So the club started as an activity offered by the city of Montreal. We ended up calling like that ended up being Saint Laurent Select, but it started as an activity. Uh, and uh, that partnership was kept since 1985 when the club was founded. Uh, and that allows us to have some money from them for salaries. So some of our coaches are actually employees of the city of Montreal. Um, we also get some money for, for uh, equipment. Uh, we have a track that we, uh, that we manage. Uh, we have a weight room that we manage. Uh, we were able to get access to, uh, to gyms, school gyms thanks to that, because it is an activity that we offer to the city. Uh, so it, it's been a very, very helpful partnership. And it was in general, like if you have a big organization, like a school or a, like a university near near where you live, like get that partnership going because it always opens a lot of doors. Um, one one opinion that I have regarding financing that is not often, uh, that not all the time, uh, like liked by mostly coaches, uh, but, but, but in general, is the fact that I think our sport is not, well financed by the base by the people actually practicing the sport <laughs> so okay. i think we're not charging enough for our services and and being involved in coaching education having actually given like seminars to other 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 sports and being around other sports i can say that most of the track coaches are very well uh, trained the, 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 we have very very good coaches in track and field and often we're not charging nearly enough where we should be charging for their services um, I think that's where the money needs to be coming from I need our club needs to be financed and uh, from the base from the users and we're not doing it enough uh, I don't think Saint Laurent is a better example of that like we're not charging enough I think we're one of the lowest uh, lowest uh, fees in, in, in Quebec in, for, for our club um, one of the reasons because of the city part Partnership that kind of since it provides salaries for the coaches we, we we were always we have that tendency of not charging much but i think that needs to change we need more professionals in the sport we need more people that can do this full-time not this not everybody needs to be full-time in this but you need to have some managers and people that do that do this this job full-time and uh, I, I don't see any other ways around that to have the users actually pay for it and and if i talk to colleagues at work and and I tell them how much it costs for a, like a season of track and field. And they say, wow, I paid that for like uh, my, my 12 year old karate class, like uh, three months a year. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not even yeah. close uh, to, 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 to what they charge in other sports. So I, I, think, I think that's an important part of finance that needs to be addressed mm -hmm. across Canada. And I think it needs to be across Canada in a sense, because it's, it's really like, there's a competition between provinces and clubs and uh, it has to be kind of a no general like, increase in, uh, in rates that goes across the, the, the country, even province, mm -hmm. or maybe at least province to, so that everybody kind of goes at the same time and there's no uh, arbitrage mm -hmm. between the different, uh, the different sure. the clubs. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, I would say that the, the clubs, there are clubs that do charge a significant amount more. And interestingly, they, you know, that's putting more money in the system, into their system, and they can do more like I, I was talking to. So um, there's a, a job posting for a job at the University of Toronto for the a head coach of the University of Toronto track club. And the, the posted salary is over $80,000 a year, which in Toronto isn't much, but <laughs> generally speaking for a track coach, uh, that's quite good. And, and, you know, I don't know that, you know, if it's, it's entirely funded by uh, membership, but uh, I was talking to Carl and he said, you know, their membership is 17, 1800 a year, which is definitely more than, than what, what I think most clubs charge. Um, so, you know, my, the money, you know, if you put money in the system, then you can start to do some interesting things. Um, Bill, you, you've got a good uh, situation out there where you, um, you, you've recently done some big fundraising for a big project. Maybe you can tell us about that and, and anything else you've got on that topic. Yeah, of financing. I think the membership fee is, you know, it's been well said. Uh, the, the real life example I'll give you is a, a member who grumbled about a hundred dollar fee or a small fee for a program it was going to last a number of months and they couldn't pay it because they, you know, already spent $2,000 for hockey that previous winter. And, you know, and that yeah. just sets the bar really as to how low we are relative to many other things. So uh, we're about 50% membership fees, uh, about 25% programs. And from a programming point of view, there's some government stuff we do that we can access, although it's fairly small. We've struck, uh, had a 10-year partnership to deliver uh, coaching and programming for the university program with the Vi campus team with the University of New Brunswick and St. John and Fredericton, which has helped us supplement our coaching at the same time provide, you know, support to our club. 
And, and then about another 25% comes from events. We are significant host indoors now and outdoors. And, uh, and the kind of the core philosophy and everybody jokes about it, my nickname's Dollar Bill and uh, it kind of around. And, and I just have a core belief that we don't lose money when we do things. And we don't need to make yeah. a fortune, but we don't lose money. We run a program, we make money. And, uh, and we try to do that across all of the programs that we do on a consistent basis. Uh, I came to this club in 2004, notwithstanding that I was a member in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Uh, it was dormant, and I, by some fluke of nature, the person that had fostered it in Normancy had kept $10,000 in the bank. So we came, we started, restarted with $10,000. I sort of made a personal commitment. We were never going below $10,000. And we have well over six figures in our bank account coming off of COVID, in a position to sort of hire we have a new employee we're hiring and doing things it's not because of any one thing it's because we've got some donors it's because we've taken programming on it's because we've grown or and and continued to pursue partnerships and we try to squeeze a nickel or two or more out of every little thing we do so uh, we try not to waste money just for the sake of it so uh, a lot of that's probably again my business background in terms of the way i think about things um you know john you referenced that one of the things that we did do as well is we, I was the leader of a facility development project in St. John and was involved with construction of a $25 million indoor facility. And, and so we did a significant amount of fundraising. And on the tail of that, we were able to refresh, do a significant kind of government grant and fundraising to refresh a bunch of equipment, including new timing equipment, which is now sort of put us in a self-sufficiency point of view around timing and, and event management and things. So, you know, the, <laughs> now the challenge is we run events all year round uh, where we didn't used to, uh, but it's uh, it becomes a significant revenue source for us during uh, the various seasons. And we're a pretty small market, but we can still make money off those events. Yeah, uh, so uh, that's, oh, go ahead, Alfredo, jump right in, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to add that we also had a story like Bill, like we had our own Bill, like uh, our club president that is still club president right now at Vige. Uh, she, she came in and again, like our club was, like basically bankrupt, we didn't have much money. And she redressed the whole thing, just having people that are good at administra administrating a club and worrying, like handling money and making sure everything comes, all the money that are, is owed comes in and everything that gets needs to be paid is paid. Just having that helped us. And, and right now, like, like, like you, Bill, I think our club is well financed and we don't have those issues anymore. And I just wanted to add one thing regarding my comment about higher fees. I think, uh, one of the fears is that we're going to lose that is we're going to lose people because we charge more and i think it's important to maintain accessibility i, I don't think I, I would never want to see a kid not be able to do track because they can't pay for it but that kid is one out of ten so I, i'm pretty sure 90 percent of everybody that does track in canada can pay more than what they're paying now or let's say close um so i think i think it's important to have programs to help that 10 percent or that few kids left and right i think it's very important to have that so that accessibility is not a it's not an issue but at the same time we can't just level everything for the 10 percent that can't pay we need to make sure we get a like a, a reasonable value for like we get a reasonable return for the value we provide for sure so there was a question that i i think fits kind of right here from robin webster i think that's robin webster from edmonton um asking because you all keep saying we um who are the we uh who who are your club champions who makes it happen um there's there's dollar bill there's dollar edbidge um <laughs> but are you know i think and i think this is this is a thing that is true and i actually um when i was doing some some coaching education i, I did a kind of a sort of independent research project into places where distance running kind of flourished so uh like uh, eugene and, and victoria and it was like there was a person that was the, there was always a person who was like this, this driving force. So, I mean, who are, who are the driving forces? I, I suspect that they are you, um, but are, are there other folks in your, you know, in your clubs and your communities that, that you see as, you know, just like the glue? No. Mo, you want to? Yeah, go ahead. So I think, yeah, I think, I think for for that, I mean, I, I'm sure that all of us came as you know, passionate about track and field, so get it going, and and it, and it drives back to that same question of club sustainability and how do you do that, and 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 the same thing is one thing that I'm trying, you know, to do is to is to step aside from, 
you know, of, of too many of the roles that, that I take on. And one of the things that we've done this, this year with, uh, with the help of our, is our treasurer is we have um, hired an HR company to come in and it's a company that deals with not-for-profit. So we've hired them to come in, take a look at our organization and, and send us in the right direction. And I think it's going to be really valuable because here's someone from the outside who deals with the same thing that we have, which is not-for-profit clubs. And, and, and I'm really looking forward to them being able to sort of highlight where our weaknesses is, are and where our strengths are and then, you know, and go from there. And one of the things that, that's already happened is that we have, you know, we are hiring a club manager um, that will be a paid position. It's not a full-time position, but it is, it is starting as a paid position. And so that's, that's quite different, you know, for, for us. And so we, you know, I, th I think that what for us, we've had, we have a group of very dedicated coaches and we have right from the beginning, it's changed. Some people have come and gone, but it's always been, there's always been this thought in the club that, that, that the club is really, all the coaches are part of the club. Like they, they are dedicated to making this thing work, regardless of, regardless of their area of expertise. They, they believe in the ocean family and, mm -hmm. and are, are willing to put in the work that's required for that. Cool. Um, when you had your hand up before, was that the comment you were, you were going to make? Yeah, it was just it, yeah, going okay. going with that kind of you know management looking. Yeah. 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 For sure. I think that's a that's a key a key element is to have because the other thing that uh, I think tends to happen is that you know coaches. Um, well, I think we sort of alluded to this a bit, but coaches want to coach, and and having coaches do administrative work that's you know not paid or that they don't have time for uh, can sort of contribute to to burnout and and sort of people leaving and, and that sort of thing so yeah having that that position can be can be quite key um i i mean if, if you guys want to jump in on what mo had to say please do i did want to also maybe you can link it together but ask a question about um because alfredo and bill have talked about the facilities um you know how can a club approach potential partners like that like the university or like the city what you know? What is it that, in your experience, makes uh, a track and field club attractive to those those entities that they will want to work with you and partner with you and, and help your club to to grow? Kurt, do you want to? You have your um, took yourself yeah, off sure. so you can go. Sure. Um, first, I just want to say I think uh, what Alfredo and Maureen said is very dead on, uh, essentially about the salaries and, you know, again, about um, sort of auditing your club um, and, and, and taking a step back and looking at it. I think both are um, val valuable points, invaluable points, um, especially even what Maureen said there at the end. Um, we do something similar at the end of every year. What we try to do is have some of the parents um, uh, go and do like sort of a informal audit, what worked, what didn't work, um, what we can do better uh, moving forward. And that's helped to inform a lot of our decisions, including us leaving, for instance, and this sort of leads into the next uh, comment around partnerships, us leaving um, training at the University of Windsor in favor of um, moving back out to Sandwich Secondary in LaSalle, Ontario, where we are forming a partnership with the um, with the school board there. Um, that was something that had been uh, sort of mentioned by a parent that, hey, maybe we should look at finding a place where the fees might be a little bit less, where you would be able to mm -hmm. increase your membership or in, in, increase the number of athletes because the amount of time that we had at the university was so small um, and, and we just couldn't, uh, manage the number of athletes that were there at the time. So it was a parent that, that, uh, made that suggestion at the end of one year. So I do think that, um, you know, uh, those sorts of things where, where you have, uh, sort of an audit can inform other decisions that, that your club can make. Um, and then my second point is, uh, how you can set up partnerships. Well, in, in our city here or in uh, LaSalle where we train, what we've tried to do is set up a partnership where we're able to provide something for um, them also. So for instance, something like resurfacing the track. Um, it, the town of LaSalle and the public school board where we are has done a terrible job of resurfacing tracks. They've 
paid a ton of money over and over. And it's always someone that's up in a suit and a tie somewhere high up that thinks that they know uh, what a surface should be or how it should be done compared to going and asking someone in the track and field world who might actually be informed as to, hey, you're putting this little bit of money in every year, putting $50,000, $60,000 in to fixing a track every you know, 16 months or every 14 months. Well, maybe we should just go and put 300000 in and we're done for 12 or 14 years as, a, you know, as compared to doing it you know, over time every second. Um, so what we've done is we've talked to the school board and, and you know, said, let us be that, that person for you. Let us be that sober second thought where uh, we can help you make some informed decisions on, on these track services that you're spending so much money on and get so much use out of, um, you know, and maybe in lieu of that, you know, we can get some sort of discount uh, for, for the facility that we're, um, that we're using currently. So those are some of the ways I think that you can, you can come up with uh, uh, partnerships with, with, uh, with other um, groups or facilities. Uh, Bill, do you wanna talk about Yeah, I mean, I mean, I guess one, one of the foundations that we've started from it always is to be a really valued partner of our facilities. I mean, one of the ones I was instrumental in getting built, which is a bit of a unique circumstance, but if we take our outdoor facility, it had been built for the 1985 Canada Summer Games and not had any maintenance when we restarted the club back in 04 and, you know, it was that end of life and it was at risk of actually being torn out. And so what we tried to do was create some events. We hosted a Canadian Masters. We went after some things that we could do to create a bit of profile in the community and, and engaged the university, which owned the track in that partnership. And, and they got quite excited about, you know, the event and we refreshed a little bit of equipment along the way. And so our role has always been, you know, we buy coffee cards for the security guards at the university. We treat them respectfully instead of treating them like other people, like, Frankly, the football guys treat them like crap and we treat them nicely and we work with the athletic director to to try to accommodate things when he needs a favor and he does the same for us and uh, we pay our bills on time. Seems like a simple one, um, but we do a lot of those things to really try to create a good working partnership and and uh, and and as a result, and we clean up garbage You know, I walk around half practices with garbage in my pockets that I empty as I leave and uh, and they know that. And they know we take care of the place. And as a result, we're treated as a very valued partner. And for example, we extended practices into August for our distance crew uh, one night a week after we'd sort of wrapped up uh, early August. And the athletic director didn't charge us. He said, look, with all you guys do for that facility, you know, these extra three or four nights, don't worry about it. And uh, so that's, you know, it seems like pretty basic stuff. But I can tell you right now, a lot of the other sports in the community don't treat the facility the same way, but we get we get payback for it. And we also keep our facility looking nice. Yeah. So it's good. Alfredo, what about you with the yeah, so Montreal? I agree with pretty much everything everybody said. And, and I would say like the, the, the word that comes to mind is professional. I think uh, like a uh, like a city, a big a big organization wants to work with people that are professional, or responsible. Like Bill said, like if you give them access to a facility, they expect you to be taking care of that facility, to be like responsible and making sure that nothing crazy happens. So I think that's one of the important parts, and it's often hard within the sports world and the amateur sport world even more uh, because you have that clash between volunteering and professional professionalism, as if those two things cannot go together. Uh, so volunteers tend to say, well, I'll do what I want because I'm here, I'm not paid, I can do whatever I want. But that can't be the case. I don't think the fact that you're a volunteer means that you shouldn't be doing the job properly. Uh, so th there's always that, that that problem within organizations to be able to handle. And I think that's one of the things we're doing fairly well in, in, in my club. Uh, not everybody's paid and not everybody's paid a lot or even to, to, the, to the degree they should be paid. But I would say most of us, most of the club uh, coaches, administrators, and any other volunteers that we have, I think they, they, they are professional and they, they try to be as professional as possible, even if they're not paid. And, and I think that's one of the things like uh, the city of Montreal looks at us and says, okay, well, we can deal with them. We can trust them to take care of these things, of these projects, because we know they're going to drive it properly and they're going to have a professional approach. Uh, one other addition, John, I'd just like to make is, is one of the observations that I learned as we built the business plan for the indoor facility was that, you know, we underpay for the vast majority of facilities we access. They're all heavily subsidized often by municipalities or universities or whichever. 
And when you went and looking at the facility we built in St. John, we had to pay rates that reflected competitive rates. We had to pay hourly rentals that reflect equivalent to what the hockey teams pay to rent ice. And, uh, and, and, the, and with what dawned on me as we did that exercise was that we really under, this is the reason we don't have facilities because we don't generate enough money to pay the rent to cover them. Whereas that's why hockey has to pay. And that's why they're not still playing out in the pond and they're playing on inside facilities these days. So part of that whole mechanism of, of the business being able to generate enough money, pay fair rent for access to quality facilities is critical. And uh, we pay five times as much for our indoor access as we do for our outdoor access in the summer for rough, for not that many months more. So it's, but it's, you know, dramatically raised the game as to what our club can do. And, uh, and it's still a lot less than what soccer's using, you know, paying to use that same facility. So anyway, some of those professionalism things and, and the willingness to figure out ways to spend more and invest in facilities is, is kind of one of the challenges people will face, I guess. Mm -hmm. Maureen, did you want to jump in on, on partnerships and, and the way you're well, for us, we've just, there? you know, we've worked really hard with both the city and, um, and, and the same thing, Alfredo, you talked with making, you know, we take care of that facility. We make sure it, it, it's good. And, and an example of, of the payback is that we had a, we wanted it resurfaced and, uh, you know, they hadn't done a great job of it. So we wanted it resurfaced. They said, yeah, you got to, you know, it's going to cost 600, 800,000. You got to bring in 400,000. So, and then this will match it. You know, you bring in 400, mm -hmm. we'll match it. So that's great. So we started, you know, and we got a, you know, a hospital grant and we got a little grant here and there and then COVID hit. And so everything just stopped. But, but because we had already started the fundraising, we did have some money go in that the city all of a sudden said, yeah, fine, we'll build it. No problem. Ended up being a 1.5 million instead of, instead of 800, wow. but it, it's <laughs> going to be beautiful. And, and there was no other expectation um, for us to raise any more funds except take care of that facility really well when it when it's done and along with that is that right from the beginning we have always developed a um, strong relationship with our public in that you know we you know if there's room on the track for the public they can be there but otherwise you know we 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 have signs and say the track is you know training here and they're fabulous now it's like you know at, at two minutes to five o'clock they go yeah yeah i know i'm off the track it's all good and the relationship is is excellent and whereas i've seen and some of the other tracks around, there's just this angst between the public and the club all the time. But yes. because we talk to them and we've, we've generated that, they're, they're excited about what the kids are doing. And they're always checking out the kids and how you doing. And, and so, again, that's that same thing is developing that relationship um, with your partners that are necessary. And for us, city and public are at, are at the top of, of, of who we need to have on board. Hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, Alfredo, keep going. We have, you know what, just to, before you say anything, we're, we're at, we got about 15 minutes to go. Um, probably zero chance we get to all of our questions, but I, I just want to kind of say at this moment, we're kind of using this as a bit of a, of a teaser. Um, Athletics Ontario is doing a coaching summit in November and um, sort of in subsequent uh Wednesday evenings, and we're, we're, we're planning to do kind of a bit of a deeper dive on some of these topics then. So if, um, you know, if you're excited by this kind of stuff and talking about, you know, the finance and the business and stuff like that, we're going to, we're going to actually, you know, bring in some of these, hopefully some of these experts and some other experts that we know uh, to talk about that a, a, as well. So we are, we, you know, we, we may not get to everything tonight, but th this is a, a really important topic, we think, and, and we want to keep uh, the conversation going. So I just wanted to put that out there because um, there's, there's just so many things we could, uh, we could do. So someone's calling Maureen for advice right now. Go ahead, Alfredo. Oh so, yeah, Karen, I, wanted to, right I wanted to give you a, what could be a bad example of, a, of, a, of a bad, what doesn't help to have a facility. It's, it's fragmentation of clubs. Uh, like an example in Montreal is the Clora BR Center. Like at Clora BR, you have like 20 clubs training on their same facility. So who's responsible for what? Nobody really knows because you have a bunch of individuals doing whatever they want, wherever they want, doing starts on all directions of the level of the, the track, like running into each other. It becomes a mess. And that gives us a really bad reputation
recreation as a sports under that facility. And then we have coaches and clubs complaining how come Club Yard is being used for this and that and not track. And, and it makes sense to say mm -hmm. we have a track. Why doesn't it, isn't it used for track? But for mm -hmm. an administrator of a facility for the city, for them, it's much easier to give it to an, uh, like a judo tournament or like a whatever gymnastics tournament because it's one person, one person is responsible. They have one person to talk to and they can easily like make, put one person accountable for what's happening. Right now, when you're fragmented, like we are in Montreal and, and I'm guessing York, uh, something similar. I know there's a lot of clubs training at York. Mm -hmm. Like when you have a situation like that, it makes it very, very hard to get the most out of that facility. So I think fragmentation of clubs is it's something that has to be uh, addressed eventually. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, that's a good question and it could go either way. I mean, fragmentation of clubs or lack of facilities. I mean, I think Montreal as a city probably, you know, could, could handle a couple indoor track facilities and, and obviously McGill has their own facility. And, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, as, as a club in Montreal, we identified that as an issue and we are, you know, I, I can't really give all the details, but we are taking steps to, you know, become independent of club OVR because We're it's, it's not a, you know, sustainable situation there for sure we've we've been a single community club since uh well almost forever but there was a brief time 25 years ago there was another but since we sort of reinvigorated in the early 2000s we've really worked hard to keep people in the tent and to have one club and be i guess be such a force that nobody would think about doing stuff without us uh there's lots of road running sort of other sides in the road community perhaps but not not on the track uh whereas really moncton fredericton and our small markets you know, have always had more than one club until recently, perhaps. But uh, and uh, it, it, you're right; it provides a united focus. It provides ability to consolidate that energy around one board and one group of leaders, and bring all coaches together. And if you're big enough, you can then accommodate the different personalities of coaches and let them have some scope to be their own group and do their thing, and hopefully not, you know, not have to be alone, but can be part of the team. So that, that's what we've tried to do, and I would agree it's critical to kind of creating that key mask to drive facilities, drive events, do all the things you want to do to build the sport. Yeah, absolutely. Like it, that's something else that, you know, I think I've thought of as well. And what is the right number of clubs, you know, in a certain geographical area? Why, well, you know, and, and in, in, you know, it's Ottawa is another example. We don't have someone from Ottawa, but I was talking to Richard Johnson about it. it you know, the Lions are, I think there's maybe one other club or two clubs, but the Lions, you know, at a certain time had kind of consolidated and um and, you know and so they they're able to provide you know a pretty big service and another example of a, of a large club um so um yeah that's another another rabbit hole to potentially go down at some point um i i wanted to ask i think let's do a couple of these sort of smaller questions just in terms of you know how your club works with with certain groups like um, and I'll, I'll kind of rapid fire and then maybe you can sort of pick and choose like what, you know, if, if you do have a response. So um, do you have officials that are affiliated with your clubs? What do you do to support those officials? Um, do you have uh, para-athletics in your, in your club? And what are some ways that, uh, that, that clubs can, can work to make sure that they are, are open and accommodating to para-athletics? Um, and then also this might be a bit of a bigger one. And, um, but you know, how does your club promote safe sport thinking about it, you know, from the lens of sort of what's going on in the world right now in sport and our sport in particular, there's been a lot of, a lot of high profile cases of, of maltreatment. Um, so, you know, what are you doing as a club to make sure that parents, if parents come, you know, they know that they're going to have a, a kind of a safe environment. So I, I wanted to get those out there and maybe we can get a couple answers to each one, just so that we can have some, have some variety of, uh, of, of information there before we get to the end. Kurt, you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Um, so maybe we'll back it up first with the safe sport. Um, so as you mentioned, what we've tried to do is, is to use some of that Canada summer grant uh, opportunities to make sure that all the coaches that do come in are sort of up to snuff with all of their safe sport. Um, so what we've done is we've created, uh, and we've done this with a lot of different things. Um, we've created spreadsheet, you know, sounds, sounds basic, seems basic, but what we've done is uh, we, we enabled one of the uh, summer job um, 
uh, people, Kennedy, uh, who's on scholarship out in uh, central Michigan, I believe. And what she did was she created a master list for us so that we can track every single um, uh, sort of accreditation or, or coaching um, certificate or anything that we would need from anyone on our staff. Because what I found was, is I was going and trying to find and make sure that every single coach had what they needed and it became too much of an onerous task. So it's in the Google Drive format. Format Everyone on our board has access to it. So we know if someone didn't get what they needed to get or hasn't completed um, you know, uh, anything at any point in time. So it just made it easy for us. I think something management wise like that is, is something that is uh, easy to do for a lot of clubs. Um, once it may take a little bit of time on the front end to do it, but it is something that's easy. And as a new coach comes in, very easy to put their, their, their name in and follow along, you know, their AO, their AC coaching number, et cetera, et cetera, their NCCP, and 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 fill it out that way um we've done that with a lot of other things uh as far as um our own club documents as well um things that we have to sign off on etc all go through that same google um uh, sort of sort of document that way so that's that's one thing i think that we've tried to do in the last two years or so to make it a little bit easier for us to track everything and and tell who has what and who doesn't have what um, as far as the para-athletics uh, question, um, we've had a couple para-athletes in the past. We have athletes who um, have identified needs on our club, but they haven't, um, they don't want to run under the Paralympic, um, you know, sort of umbrella yet. Um, so the toughest thing for us is convincing them that they can do that or there is this avenue for them and they can be successful, you know, potentially be successful in it. Um, whereas when they do come, they just want to be regular kids. Um, you know, uh, they don't want any special treatment. They just kind of want to integrate. Um, so that's been the one thing where we have the athletes, but a couple of them anyway, but they just don't want to, you know, their parents don't want them to be sold out for that. Um, compared to telling them that, hey, this is something that, you know, you can be incredibly proud of and look at all of these athletes that are doing, you know, incredibly well uh, worldwide, you know, under the Paralympic uh, umbrella. So I think that that's sort of where we're at with, with our club. Um, and you might have to remind me of the first part um, of, officials. of that three-part question. Officials. officials. Um, we have a very aging population with officials in our city. They're fantastic, they're great. They've been just about everywhere in, in the world. Uh, but one of the things that we did talk about this year at one of our meetings was if we are able to host more meets, we do have to create a pool of officials. So one of the things that we did talk about was including those summer um, uh, coaching uh, positions them also taking an officials course. And then we have had some discussions with uh, the faculty of ed as well uh, in, in the kinesiology department for trying to recruit some of those uh, student um, students or, or, or student teachers uh, into uh, officiating as well. So those are the three things that we, we've done uh, most recently. That's great. Alfredo, you're off mute so you can go next. Yeah, uh, so um, I, I think you mentioned areas that I don't think we're doing very well as a club. So if we're talking personally, um, so our para, we have a para group that is mostly wheelchair athletes because we have one coach that specializes in wheelchair athletes. So therefore we have that para group. But if tomorrow morning we have uh, CP uh, people, cerebral palsy, or we really don't have groups that are specifically designed for them. We, we try to integrate them within our groups, but it hasn't been an easy thing to do. Uh, I think we need to make more of an effort to, uh, to do that. In terms of officials, we're completely failing. Uh, this is something where we need to really, really address. And it's causing us headaches because we organize a lot of meets. We're involved in the organization of meets across Quebec in many, for, for, for in, in many facilities. And, and really, uh, we don't have our own officials. We need to basically get officials from somewhere else it's always a problem and we need to invest more time in doing that so this is something that i i, I really don't know what the, the the way of attracting them or keeping them but i'm i'm, I'm hopeful uh, somebody will give us a, a better like better insight in how to to get more officials within the club and and for the safe sport part uh, i also think for i don't know if it's the same thing for most clubs but i remember reading so 
a club that was mentioned earlier by you, John, uh, had a there was a big scandal, big issue. Uh, I remember I remember reading that report that came out, the first report that came out, and looking at the report and saying, if that had happened to us, would we have done better? And this is the thing that I'm not sure. <laughs> In the sense that, do we have that big infrastructure that they had to handle the problem, even though they didn't handle it properly? I think uh, we all agreed there were there were a lot of things that didn't work out pretty well. But but I don't think we would have done better. And I think uh, this is if something like that would happen to our club, like it, it would be something that uh, I don't know how well we would handle it, and I don't know if we have the whole all the structures necessary to to handle complaints like that. I'm happy to know that now there is a kind of an independent board that's been created, the the national level that complaints can go to, and and uh, we we have that at uh, the provincial level also. We have an independent. Um, committee that that can handle complaints for clubs in, inside clubs. So I think that that's good, but uh, but I don't think most clubs are prop properly equipped to handle a situation yeah. that can arise from say sport. Uh, even though we're a big club, we have a fairly independent board. It's very hard for the board to be fully independent because <laughs> like what happens on most boards, you have ex-athletes that have coaches that are still coaching in the club. Uh, you have um, so, so ex-coaches, you have people that are know each other it becomes very hard to be fully independent so so yeah i don't know how how it works in other clubs but i, I would say that when i read that report to me it was kind of a okay like something needs to be done this is not uh, this is not good yeah yeah for sure and i mean i think on on a couple of points um there you know on, on the safe sport i know um uh, Athletics Canada's director of safe sport chris winters on the call and uh, a lot of he's working with the provincial branches to do a lot of a lot of things that I think will will help in this area. Like Kurt mentioned, the Google Sheet. You know, I know I can't really give details, but I know that you know we're working with the branches to kind of hope to try to do something like that that just is embedded in registration, so that when people register, like you you know, a club will be able to find all that information be easier. So it's it's definitely you know possible technology wise, and it's I think that's a it's a an area that's been identified as you know, like a need. And, and so I think the, the, uh, the provincial branches and AC are, are working on kind of finding that support for clubs and, and everything. So um, Mo, Thelma really wants you to talk about your official solution most. So Thelma, Thelma's been, been, she sent a bunch of messages about it. So I knew, I knew Thelma was here to, you got to unmute though, Maureen. Um, I knew Thelma was here to support Maureen. So there, there you go. Okay. So we just really, we pushed having officials in the club right from, right from the get go. We have a very strong provincial officials organization that helps us out. And we just made that a real priority in getting people trained, even if, you know, even if it's just a, you know, like 90 minutes, we get all the parents there and some of them get turned on to officiating and they end up being great officials. And it's just been, it's just a priority. So we, we've got the provincial people that come in, do a workshop and then people say, Hey, you know, I, I like that. I really like that. And they try it. They like it. They're not afraid anymore. So I, I think it's just, just do it and, and you'll get the officials you want. Um, and they're quite dedicated to, to the track, your, your club and, and, and other organizations as well. So it's, it's, uh, we're very happy with what we've got going and we're continuing to push it and get more and more and more. It helps, it helps with sustainability too. It helps us, you know, be independent in the events. We, we don't have to call on so many other people to come in. We've got them in the club. And it's, and it's really important. And the young kids see those people being officials and they say, Hey, yeah, I want to do that. And, um, and so it just is, it keeps going. Yeah. That's, that's great. Anything to add on the, on the pair front or the safe sport front? Uh, we, you know, we, we have, we encourage wheelies and we, we bought a chair so we could have them in our hosted meet. We only have, you know, a very young, uh, you know, uh, a CP girl who's, who's going to be an Olympian. She's already told us that. And we have a Blade Runner apparently showing up this week. So, you know, it's, it's not something we have skill in or anything, but, you know, we integrate them and we'll see where it goes from there. Great. Yeah. And I, I just to, to kind of point out again, resources for, for people, uh, um, you know, the Paralympics just, just closed. And if you check back on the, the Athletics Canada um, social media, um, we shared a whole bunch of sort of just little, little explanations of the different, the different classifications and sort of how, how stuff works. And, and there's going to be another uh, resource coming soon, we're calling it Becoming Para Ready. It's, it's quite a, a good and, and detailed document to help clubs, um, you know, figure out how, how to, uh, to accommodate para athletes and, and, you know, it's, 
I think the main message is, is it's not it, it's not as hard or scary or complicated as you think. Uh, I think that's there's a sort of a fear that this is like a whole other thing, but it's it, it doesn't need to be, and, and it's, it's certainly possible for our clubs to be integrated as as we hope um, on the para front. So, um, Bill. I know we're just one minute over time, so we'll give Bill, and then I have one last question to our- I'll make it so, quick. Uh, Much like uh, Maureen, uh, we do regular officials training. We have a provincial base of officials we can draw from, and what we try to do is make them feel really thanked. We feed them well, we treat them well, we thank the heck out of them, and and we just, we actually try to make it so they like to officiate in St. John more than Moncton and Fredericton so that they come <laughs> to us more. It, blatantly, we do that. We buy them coffee, we, we do all kinds of stuff to try to make them feel better. And we have the same challenges everybody else does in terms of uh, our aging base and adding to it, but we do much the same things, Maureen, that you mentioned about training each year. Uh, para also keep it open. We don't have any right now. We've had some, we accommodate, we adjust our training and, and do our best. Mm -hmm. We're a small market, so there's not been a lot, but we take them when we can. Safe sport, maybe I'll just say, having been at the chair of Athletics Canada and on the front line of this stuff in my face for four years, I took it very personally that the club would try to set a high bar. So we actually reworked our following some of those same reports that Alfredo read. Um, we revamped our board with more parents and less coaches. Um, we or more kind of independent voices that weren't on the track, let's say. Uh, we amped up our screening. We, you know, put our safe sport practices in place. We make sure we do them each year. We, we do our best to really stick to rule of two and, you know, so safe sport practices. And we do communicate with our parents uh, at the start of really every season, sort of that, you know, we make every effort to provide a safe environment. If they have concerns, they can report to us. They can report to third parties, things like that. So that's really all we can do at the local level. Uh, but we all need to be vigilant and watching for people that are misbehaving. Because yeah, the sport will absolutely. attract them sometimes, and sometimes those of us that have been in for a long time can turn a blind eye to people who have just always been that way, and mm -hmm. or act certain ways, or say certain things, and the standard is higher. We need to expect yeah. higher quality of behavior from people, and as club leaders, we need to have the backbone to stand up to them and say when things aren't right. So, for sure, even if they're so, our best friends. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Alfredo, I'll let you say one last thing. Well, it's very quick. Uh, just one of the things that helped for the safe sport part is I think it's being able to work as a team within the club. I think if you don't have a lot of rogue coaches or coaches working independently in their own little world, that that yeah. if the people work together, they talk to each other, it makes it much harder to have abuse situations going on because somebody's going to kind of bring somebody else into in line if, if something goes wrong. So I think that's one of the things teamwork within the club can, can be a defense against uh, abuses sometimes. That's it. Fantastic. So as, as predicted, uh, we, we covered a lot of ground and there's still more to cover. So, um, you know, check, uh, you know, check athletics Ontario and, and athletics Canada's uh, coaching newsletter for, for information on the AO summit, that's going to come up in November. And there's another event that Kurt, uh, maybe you want to give a little plug there to the, the women's can this year that, that in November that you're putting on. Yeah. Um, we are still planning to have our second uh, annual women's can, uh, program. Um, there are some, uh, special guests hopefully, uh, that are uh, going to confirm this week and hopefully it'll get to come out, uh, uh, pretty soon. Yeah. And that is, what is it though? I say, kept saying women's can, uh, I know what it is. What is we, it? Uh, so our women's can program is a program that we've, uh, established that we can, so that we can encourage female coaches to be involved, um, in the sport of track and field and in sports in general, uh, whether they come from high school or, um, university college, et cetera. Um, at the same time, uh, it's set up to uh, help fund um, keeping younger girls, uh, ethnic girls, um, BIPOC involved in sport. And as well, uh, this year we have a Mother's Can uh, a program that's tied to it where uh, the mothers get to come together with the daughters as well. And we send them off where the mothers are able to get a, a, some skill on how to um, deal with uh, <laughs> the attitudes and, and some of the other things that some of the young uh, girls are, are coming with um, where they'll get some instruction on that. And then the girls will get some instruction on possibly how to deal with their parents um, as, as well. Nice. So, What's the date? Yeah. What's the date on this? Um, tentative, tentatively, it is the third weekend, uh, sorry, the fourth weekend in October. 
tentatively. Okay. Okay. Um, we, we're going to confirm that in the next week as well. Is it live or is it online or what's the, uh, the, uh, women's know. can is, is going to be online. Uh, the, uh, girls and the mothers can, uh, is scheduled to be live, uh, pending, uh, what's going on in the world and the climate sure. of COVID as yeah. with everything. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you everyone. I, I, I really appreciate it. And you know, like we could, talk for hours but we promised an hour and we're already over so we're going to respect people's time but we will hopefully have you back again uh whether it's with ao in, in december i've just told it's december not november um and uh you know talk more about this and help help uh, clubs grow so thank you very much and have a good night everyone thank you Bye.